Hey, what's going on, man? Can you uh, hear us all right? What it is. How you doing? Hello. Yeah. Thanks Hi. for thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I know this is outside the uh, the time you go, the time you normally do uh, press, according to the publicist. So I appreciate it. Oh yeah, it's fine, man. How are you guys? We're doing go good, man. I got to tell you, I've seen you guys. Uh, oh God, I don't know four or five times, and uh, I get chills every time. Is Buck Cherry the greatest rock and roll band hey. of the last twenty five years? I mean, you're asking me, uh, you know, I think uh, we're the only uh, rock and roll band that's putting out records, you know, other than ACDC, which is uh, really amazing that they're, they're still doing it and they're still putting out really great records. Um, but um, the greatest rock and roll band, you know, that, you know, that that would be uh, not for me to say, but um, uh, I'm just I'm grateful that uh, we've been able to do it for 22 years for sure. And we're still putting out uh, records like Hellbound, which drops uh, June 25th, and it's really good. Yeah, I heard the uh, the single "So Hot," and uh, man, as soon as it, uh, Trent over here, the the guy with the long hair, he was like, "Man, have you heard the new Buck Cherry song?" And I said, "No, not yet. How is it?" And he goes, "Well, it's Buck Cherry." And as soon as I started playing it, I was like, "Oh fuck!" You can already tell this is Buck Cherry. Yeah, I fucking love yeah. the single, man. Yeah. yeah, it is a good Thanks, one. Man. Wait, wait till you hear the wait till you hear the whole record. I mean, we're dropping the second single. The title track Hellbound this month, uh, like June twenty something or May May twenty something. So, um, yeah, that that's like my favorite song on the record, Hellbound. So you'll 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 dig it. It's a good video too. Sweet. I was actually thinking about buying that signed vinyl, but it looked like you guys sold out pretty quickly with the vinyls. Yeah, we did sell out, and then they added some more, but I don't know where it's at at this point. But um. Yeah, people are crazy about vinyl now. And, you know, I just, I have no vinyl record player and I don't even fucking care, you know. Um, but like Stevie and all the rest of the guys in the band are really into vinyl. And I'm like, fuck, I, I just don't get it. But, you know, because you got to store this shit and you got to have a, you know, a fucking record player to play it. And it's like, I can't listen to it out on the road, which I spend a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. So, it just makes no sense for me, but um, I understand how people really get into it. As far as the sound quality, it's really, really cool. With the uh, with this new album coming out, I know, uh, I think it was an interview last year, you had said uh, uh, it takes you months and months and months to write a record, and it's like a blip on the screen when you drop it, and that's a drag. And you were referring to uh, an article that you'd read about how people's attention spans have whittled down to like seven seconds. Uh, because it's you know, less, It's less than that now. You know, I mean, it, I gets, believe it. it gets less and less, you know. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, really frustrating, you know. Um, but that being said, we're, we're just we're, we're changing our approach, you know, like on this record, we're we're going to just completely focus on marketing this record, you know, through the Internet and just content, 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 which would be we're going to make a video for every song on the record. And, um, that's something we've never done. And it's like, that really made me happy because, um, then it becomes, you know, people start hearing your whole record, you know, because everybody is single orientated, which is fine. I'm that way too. You know, I just listen to one song. I don't go and buy, like, I don't go buy records, you know, full link records. I go and listen to one song that I like. And I'm like, I want to get that song. And then maybe I'll listen to a lot of other tracks on the record, just verse chorus and go through them and pick what I like, you know, and then I go and I'll, you know, go to a whole. Uh oh. Uh oh. Let's see. That's a Other... I think we, we lost yeah, you there I for a minute. Just now. Oh, sorry. No, there Can we now? go. Yep. Gotta love technology. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh boy, I hope this isn't the internet uh, thing. Just there's no nonsense. Damn internet. Um, I know. <laughs> no, it should be fine. Every time we do a Zoom call, we have these issues. That's all right. That yeah. happens. <laughs> it's, it's, it's never it's never end because yeah. Oh man. It's never a crash report episode we without one uh, difficulty. Here, so. We're always always riddled with technical difficulties here, really losing <laughs> it. <laughs> All right, I, let's see. I, it looks like it's getting a little better. 
Oh man. Can you hear, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, hopefully we're good. Sorry. I don't know what the deal is. Uh, right. But no, I think we're all uh, very excited for the new record. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that, you know, Buck Cherry is basically, uh, you guys have been a mainstay now for, for so long. And a while ago, you know, you had said that uh, you didn't think you'd make it to 30. You thought it was going to be a tragic ending for you. And, and now you're a grandfather, which congratulations on that, by the way. Woo. It's crazy. Yeah, that I mean, so it's crazy. It, it, and you've been sober for, what is it, 25 years now? Is that right? Or close to it? 20, 26 years. 26 wow. years. So, yep. but, so you, were, uh, you were sober when the band formed then, in the, in the 90s then? I was, yeah. Um, I got, you know, I got loaded from 13 to uh, 23. Really, really good. And uh, you wouldn't even recognize me at that point, you know, um, at one point I had alcohol poisoning. I, you know, just a lot of, a lot of things. I was a horrible drunk and, and drug addict. And, uh, and, uh, I didn't know that people got sober and lived sober until I got uh, arrested in Orange County, California and got a DUI. And, um, and that's, that was the turning point because my first daughter was born and I got a DUI and I was broke and my band had imploded. And, um, I was like, fuck. And, and so um, the, the court lady uh, court ordered me all these AA meetings on top of the ones that I had to do for the DUI program. And I'm so grateful for that because um, I went to them, you know, and uh, at one point, some guy got up, up to the podium and told my story and was not a musician and didn't look anything like me. And I just was like, it, it was like this moment of clarity, you know, and I was like, wow, like I, I'm going to try this, you know, because it was the last stop on the block for me. You know, at that point, I was living in a one bedroom apartment with two other musicians, no refrigerator, roaches everywhere. You know, I was I was uh, drinking. Uh, I was passing out twice a day. I was doing a lot of other drugs, uh, cocaine, meth dropping a lot of acid, smoking weed around the clock. It was just, I was just a mess, you know? And, um, and, uh, then I had this little, I had this daughter, you know, and, and, uh, I didn't want her ever to see me loaded, you know? So, uh, it was uh, that series of events all kind of happened and that's what got me clean. And so I was, I was clean for over a year before I met Keith. And then that's when we started our journey and, and, uh, yeah, so my whole professional music career, I've been sober. Well, see, I feel like it's like the, the opposite for most people, you know, they, they start finding success and then it, you know, then things get out of hand and then it, you know, this whole train wreck and then eventually they get sober where you did it backwards almost, which is, which is great, man. I mean, that, that's uh, amazing to be sober that long. Congrats. They had a backwards. Yeah. I, I thank story, God. You know? If I would have had any, if I would have had money and success when I was using, it would have been bad real quick they would have been like probably death jails institution or death well i know and i, I don't want to get too dark here but i know that uh, when you were 10 years old your father had committed suicide uh, does yes. that do you think that uh like the the past issues that you had stemmed from from that at all did that play a role in it uh, you know, everybody's got their story, you know, and, and uh, there, there, there's definitely a lot of childhood trauma for me, not just my my father's stuff. But, you know, uh, I don't want to get too into like all of it, but um, I don't think I, I had the disease of alcoholism, you know, and I was born with it. And and although it, it runs uh, rampant in my family, you know, like my father had it and, you know, my my great grandfather had it and. So I just got it. And my mom does it. My mom's a normie. My sister's a normie. And um, I just have it real bad. And so that's just what it is. And and I'm very sad that my father became a statistic, you know. Um, you know, I would have loved to have him in my life all these years, you know. And I've learned to forgive him, you know, over the years. And um, it was really tough for me. Um, so, um, yeah, you know. Oh man, Again. and uh, it's part of you know, but uh, it's a it's a disease that's really uh, affected a lot of families. 
I know he gave you a copy of uh, The Long Run from the Eagles uh, when you were a little kid. I think that was like the first record you had ever gotten. Is that, uh, was, was yeah. he the one that got you into, into music? Um, he, he played guitar and sang, you know, I have my, my father, uh, my father went to Vietnam and he actually, um, he was in college and Vietnam happened and he, he's, a he loves his country and he dropped out of college and went to Vietnam, uh, voluntarily. And because he was a smart guy, he didn't have to be in combat. He was, he had, you know, they, they make you take tests and he tested really high and they put him in an office job over there. And, um, I have a, I have a news clipping where he was playing guitar and singing for the troops in Vietnam. And there was John Wayne and all the troops around my father singing. And, oh my uh, God. Wow. Wow. yeah, that was really cool. And, um, I don't have a lot of memories of my, like my dad would pick up the guitar and sing occasionally, like when we, we'd go camping a lot and fishing sometimes. And, um, but, uh, that was it. He was very passionate about acting. That's what he loved. Is that why you started acting later on? People ask me that, but um, I just kind of fell into my first acting role. It just kind of happened through uh, Buck Cherry, actually. You know, um, it's like it's kind of a long story. I'll try to make it short. Uh, we were in Australia. We were we were uh, playing a show on the first record, and our tour manager says, "Hey, you're not going to believe this. Val Kilmer is here in Australia." And wants to be put on the list. Him and his girlfriend want to come to the show. And I was like, what? We're, oh. And we were like, fuck yeah, man. Like, do whatever you got to do. Get the guy, you know. And it turns out that his girlfriend was into Buck Cherry and got him to get her into the show. <laughs> and then um, and then we started talking backstage. And then we kind of exchanged. We, we were talking actually about motorcycles and riding motorcycles. And I had a motorcycle at the time. And. And he did. And he's like, let's ride in L.A. sometime. And I go, yeah, sure. And I gave him my number and thought nothing of it. I'm, he's never going to call me up, you know, and cut to like months later, I happen to be in L.A. I'm not on the road. And I get a call from him and he's like, hey, I'm at the Chateau Marmont. Why don't you come down here and, and hang out for a sec? And I was like, OK. And I'm like, fuck, this is crazy. And I, I go down there and and he's about to shoot a film called The Salton Sea. And uh and anyways, I thought they just wanted me to write a song, you know, maybe for the movie. And um, it turned out that they wanted to have me in the movie somehow. And I was like, uh, OK. And then the director, DJ, said, just pick a role and come in an audition for it. And I go, OK. And, you know, I've never acted, uh, you know, but uh, I have, you know, you know, mu music and I, yeah, I know how to be on when I got to be on. And like, you know, so I'm just like, fuck it. I, I chose like this really hard <laughs> role and my very first acting audition, I go in and there's Val Kilmer and DJ Caruso sitting there looking at me in just a room. And I'm like, Oh fuck. What the <laughs> fuck did I do? I cannot believe I'm doing this. This is what I'm saying in my head. And then we just did the scene and that was it. Um, they they didn't call me for like three weeks. And I'm like, oh, I didn't get it, you know. And then DJ calls me and he goes, hey, listen, I didn't want to tell you then because I just wanted to see how you were going to do. Um, but we already had casted that part, you know, but I'm going to give you a different part. And it's like actually more scenes. And I was like, great. So I played this character called Big Bill in the Salton Sea. And that was my first acting role. And then after that, I did a bunch of more things with uh, DJ. He, he, I was in the, Sh the Shield, a version of The Shield, and then Eagle Eye he directed, and he had me back on a couple of things, which is great. And then it parlayed into other things, and that's how I got started. That's fucking wild, man. Oh, my God. Literally he said no to nothing. It's just like, yes, okay, sure. Fuck yeah, it. Wow. I'll do it. Just got to go. Just do it. Just get yeah. it. You know, I'm, I'm grateful for, you know, the opportunity. And I learned a lot on that first, the first scene, the first shoot uh, scene I did, Vincent D'Onofrio is on set and then Val Kilmer and here I come walking in and Danny Trejo and I'm like, fuck, in my head, wow. I'm like, I am so out of my comfort zone, you know, like, you know, I just showed up just uh got in there and did it and, and learned so much from those guys they're so talented 
Well, back to the uh, the the first Buck Cherry record because uh, it's it's so good, man. And uh, honestly, even you Thank know, you. and Time Bomb is so underrated. But before we we get into that, you know, the obviously the song "Lit Up" is a classic Buck Cherry song. It's one of those songs you have to play every set. And uh, I know it's about the first time you did coke, but I'm really I was blown away. Is it true that the first time you did that it was on a Ouija board? It is. I did. A, I did a line off a Ouija board in a, a little apartment <laughs> party next to my high school. Holy wow. fuck, man! That just seems like a horrible idea for a first time. <laughs> now, now when you're, you know, I was just, I didn't give a shit. You know, I, I went into a room and, you know, I'm already deep in my stuff. You know, I, I was like, coke. Yeah, I mean, I loved cocaine, but I was also on a tight budget at that point I was working at a, you know, I was delivering pizzas, uh, riding a scooter, you know, cause I got, I could get, I got a permit to ride a scooter at 15 and a half. And, uh, and so that was, you know, like cocaine was like so expensive for me. Like, you know, so I would just do Coke whenever I could when people had it, you know, but I was more into like pooling my money together to get paps blue ribbon with my buddies and, and buying like, <laughs> <laughs> and buying shitty weed and or we would go down to Irvine Meadows and we would buy sheets of acid for a hundred bucks at like a Grateful Dead show. We just go to the parking lot and then we would we would buy a hundred hits of acid for, you know, a dollar a piece. Right. So a hundred bucks. And we would sell them for three bucks a piece at high school. And like <laughs> fucking we made bang. <laughs> oh man, that's fucking cool. And then, well, you know, the second album time bomb, it's so good. And, uh, you guys hardly got any love from the label. I know that, uh, you know, you had said that, um, if they, you know, were unhappy with it, you guys would have went back to the drawing board, wrote more songs and all that. What, uh, what happened? What did, why do you think that they, the label at the time didn't push it as, as much as they could have? I'll tell you what happened. We we did a song called Anything, Anything, a Drama Rama song. And yeah. we just did this rough demo of this song, right? And for some movie soundtrack, and they, they liked it and they put it on their movie soundtrack. It was it was like roughly mixed. It was nothing, you know? Afterthought. And I mean, we love the song, of course, and it was it was a cool vibe, you know, Buck Cherry did. But our our A and R guy at the time just loved this song and he wanted to he wanted to put it on the time on record and make it the first single. And we were like, what? No, no way. You know, I mean, at that point I just didn't, you know, looking back, I'm like, I should have just re-recorded it. Like, so it just sounded good for, you know, my taste and everybody else in the band as well. We wanted to be great because we had just done a rough demo and we should have just gone with it in order to keep the momentum and have the label behind us. But Instead, I was like, listen, we'll just write. But they had already greenlit our record. So it was like hard for us to take. Like, here we have this great record and you're telling us that you want to do this other song. So I go like, let's just keep writing more songs because we want to be true to ourselves and we want to write our own music. And, you know, like and that was like this um, power struggle, I guess you could say that eventually buck cherry got uh you know it affected us the worst because we didn't get a whole lot of support on that record and it's kind of the, this lost record uh time bomb and the people who have heard it love it you know and and we still play a lot of those songs live was it kind of a, a rough period because you know once all that happened and then um after i think you guys had went on hiatus and then you and keith did the whole thing with with slash and duff and and um uh, Matt Sorum and I know you know there was all the the whole Velvet Revolver thing which everybody knows about but uh, you know when that when like when that didn't pan out and then Buck Cherry kind of went on hiatus when was that like a real uh, that had to be I guess uh, I don't know I mean I had to be a horrible feeling because you know the first record you had you know lit up and and uh, for the movies and things like that and then it's like oh boy like now it all kind of feels like it's not working out. It was a very, very challenging time period for sure, you know, um, but, you know, looking back, you know, it's like everything happens for a reason and um, it made the success of 15 so incredible and, uh, you know, um, you learn what you're made of in those moments, you know, it was like, well, 
you know, I'd only have to ask myself like Josh, what, you know, like what, a, what is this to you? Are you passionate enough to, to get it, to get to that next step and, and to believe in yourself and, and go through it. And, and uh, yeah, I just kept focused on my outcome, you know, and um, everything worked out and we had so much going against us that the fact that we had the success that we had on 15 is insane. It's the, like the most insane comeback story. I, you know, we didn't even have a record label, you know, and just so many things we made that, we made that record in 15 days. That's why we called it 15. You know, that, that was it. We recorded it in 15 days. We had a tiny budget from a Japanese record deal, you know, um, and then, you know, the rest is history, you know, it was like crazy bitch started getting this momentum and we were like, oh my God, this thing is going to be crazy. You know, I just, we, we didn't, we didn't even see it coming. You know, we just believed in ourselves and, and the rest is history. Yeah. You guys were, when that record came out, you guys were going to, uh, do a video for, for next to you. Right. And then like, right before you started shooting, your manager was like, Hey, like, yeah. hang like back to fuck up. Like this song, crazy bitch is really starting to to pop off. So then you guys had to shift gears a little bit. That's exactly how it happened. You've done your homework. Yes. Um, we, we were, we were about to make the video for next to you. And it was the, at that point, my space was still going on and it like all these people, we had like a million, uh, listens of, you know, or whatever you call it of crazy bitch. And then radio stations in the United States, were putting it on the radio. They were doing their own edits and putting it on the radio. And we we're like, oh my God, we got to jump on this, you know, like f forget next to you. Let's, let's get on with this. And, and then, you know, you guys know what happened after that. It was just nuts. And then after that, of course, we had this upstreaming clause where Atlantic was just distributing the record, but they didn't want anything to do with it. And then as soon as crazy bitch, they, they upstreamed us on Atlantic Rex. So we had a, uh, now we were on Atlantic recording artists and, you know, and then it's, you know, it's so weird. They almost didn't want to do sorry after the whole crazy bitch thing. They didn't want to like put out sorry. And we're like, no, we got to put out sorry. It's going to, you know, th this is a great song. And you, and then sorry almost outdid crazy bitch. It's crazy. Yeah. I think I had heard, uh, I mean, I'm a young guy. So when that came out, I was like 11 years old or something. Yeah. We were both 11 years old. <laughs> yeah. So I, but I remember hearing sorry first, cause my mom would listen to like the, uh, it was like the top 40, you know, station or whatever. And so they would play sorry on that, you know, cause that was the song that, you know, every band dreams of having where it crosses over from, you know, it's not just on, on rock radio, it's on top 40 and you know, all this and that. So I remember hearing that song, but what I remember, uh, I, it was on Crew Fest uh, in 2008. My mother, uh, such a kind soul, took me to that show. <laughs> and uh, that was when, um, you know, I don't I can't remember if you still do it. It's been a few years since I saw you guys. But, you know, you would do a, a whole little ramble type thing in, in the middle of Crazy Bitch. And, boy, let me tell you, that is just not the thing you want to be a part of with your mother right there. You know, and then of course it got worse when, when uh, the crew came out and Tommy had the, the titty cam and all that. It was a really, uh, it was cool right. for me as a teenage boy going through puberty, but you know, my but parents have are, your mom there. Is not, not <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, well, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. But I'm, um, you know, I'll let her know. I'm sure it was fun. Oh, it was, it was a blast. But you know what I, what I find so interesting and I, I did not know this until I was researching for this interview is that, uh, and I don't, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you called your mother, uh, and recorded, uh, the vocal on her, uh, answering machine so that you didn't forget it. I did. You know, my mom has been my big, my biggest supporter. We are very close and we've been pretty much transparent since I was uh, a teenager, you know? So, She's seen it all. She knows it all. We're very, she, very honest with, you know, everything that I've done. And so, um, she knows, she knows me, you know, she knows, uh, that it's a part of me, you know? So that being said, yeah, I just was like, Hey, keep this, you know, I gotta, I gotta remember this. And <laughs> I did, I recorded it on there, you know, to your story, my mother, when I was in high school, I was, a, I was really in to Sam Kinison. I thought 
Kennis, I don't know if you know Sam Kennison, but he's a yep. dirty comedian. Yep. And just so super talented. And I was like, Sam Kennison was coming to some some venue and I wanted to go. And it was like my 15th birthday or something. And my mom was like, she got me tickets. And I went to Sam Kennison. It was like, fuck yeah. Like it was like, <laughs> it was amazing, you know? So I know what you mean. Like, but you know, to go there and to to um to have my mom just be cool with it is was really important. And it took a lot of the power out of it. I didn't have to sneak, you know, I could tell I could talk to her about anything, you know, which was really good for me, you know? Well, that's a good thing. I think most people uh, wish they had that. Uh, I'm very close with my mother, but I think most people wish they could have a relationship like that, you know? Yes, sir. What led to the uh, the re-record of Crazy Bitch last year? Um, with, I, I don't even know how you pronounce it. I think it's Wi-Fi's funeral. Is that right? Is that how you say it? Yeah, wi- Wi-Fi's funeral. Yeah. Um, it had been a long time coming. We had been trying to get a hip-hop collaboration on that song for a long time. I'm a huge, I love hip-hop. I listen to a lot of hip-hop. So, um, you know, to have him uh, feature on that track was, like, amazing. And, you know, I know that our core audience really didn't get it, but it wasn't about that. It was about, um, it was about doing something uh, unique. And, you know, like... Aerosmith had done it back in the day with Run DMC, and I just I always wanted to do that because I really respect hip hop artists, and I just think that it is the you know I've I study hip hop songs and how they put them together, and like it is it is such a crazy art form, like and it's really hard to do. Like they make it seem easy, but it's not. It's like it's really um, a crazy art form that I really like, and. Um, and I feel like that's where all the outlaws are, you know, so uh, that's that's why I, I really want to do it. And I like Wi-Fi and um, he was really gracious and was jumped all over it. Have you heard that, Trent, or no? I don't think so, but it is really cool when you get to see the rock world and hip hop world come together. Yeah, I think they should do uh, they, yeah. they should do more of that. It's not a very common thing. Now, I, you know, you kind of see a lot of it with like a little bit of hip hop and, and country kind of crossovers these days. Or collabs. Yeah, they call it hick hick hop. Hick hop. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, I I think the the crossover is a good thing, you know. Um, especially you know the older you get, I you love know. it. Yeah, I mean, when I was young, I used to be like, ah, oh, fuck that, I want to listen to that shit. But now, you know, the older I get, right. the more my music tastes kind of, you know, they're they're a little more open than they used to be. Sure. I mean, everything's spread out now. It's like, you know, it's just fun. So when you guys released the uh, the Confessions record, I know there was supposed to be like a movie uh, that was going to go along with with that whole thing. Whatever whatever happened with that? Yeah, I I wrote a screenplay. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, just you know funding, of course. Yeah, that was sure. really. It was like okay, we're going to fund this, and it would be a short film, and like, um, who's going to do that? You know, who's going to fund something that you know is basically gonna what could we do do with it except maybe showcase it at like uh like these little film festivals if we could even do that you know my whole idea i you know i have these big ideas and then it takes a lot of money to like try to get (laughs) them (laughs) over the finish line you know but my idea was like yeah let's let's make this movie which is loosely based on my childhood you know but and then we could do like we could do like these film festivals and then do headlining shows in the, at the film festival we could buck cherry could play the whole record and then we could showcase the film you know and that would be really cool and we just couldn't get the money well and yeah, i think you had said you didn't feel comfortable like asking fans for you know like to do like a, a gofundme or something like that too that was that was brought up and i was like at the time i'm like i don't think that's that's like really cool to to do because you know i know how hard it is you know the hard working people they they have only so much for concert dollars you know and it's like to ask them to do all that um it just seemed silly to me so uh you know a few years ago when when uh when keith left the band was it uh was it, and i know stevie's been around for for a long time but was it was it difficult when keith left since he had been there with you since the beginning like, i know you said the the last few years were, were really weird and it, it wasn't quite a band anymore and things like that but was it um and and obviously you know war paint was a 
fucking fantastic. Probably War Paint was probably the best record in my opinion since fifteen. But was it a little hard uh, to continue on without him? You know, we'd already been through a, a few departures from band members, and um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You know, we'd already been through a few departures uh, from band members, so we, at that point, we got really good at kind of. Uh, our radar was up all of us, not just Keith, you know, like all of us have radar up now because we've, we've dealt with a few transitions in that department and we had been on the road. And when you're on the road, you're, you're in close quarters with people. And so you just know when things are about to go down. And, um, it it was, it was like three years. I, I feel like it was like three years in the, in the making to actually happen. And, um, I'm sure it was a hard decision for him to make, but uh, everything happens for a reason and people have to do what they got to do uh, to, for themselves to be happy, you know? And I think that's ultimately what happened, but you'd have to ask him, you know, sure. about, about all his reasons and why he wanted to do what he had to do. But that being said, I've known Stevie since I was 19, way before I got into, before I even met Keith, you know? So um, Stevie never was in a position to where he got to be a part of a lot of the songwriting. So for him to uh, take over that role was really exciting for him and for me, because we have a really good friendship uh, on top of it. And we did the Josh Todd and the conflict record first before we even did a Buck Cherry record. And that was a lot of fun. And we went back to like the heavy heaviness of my roots and and uh, we had a lot of fun making that record. And it's a really good record. And so by the time we got to the War Paint songwriting sessions, we were in full, what I like to call full song. And um, it was just a labor of love at that point. And so it was a pretty smooth transition, honestly. I know you, you said you, uh, you've known him for so long. What, what, took it, uh, what took so long for Stevie to join Buckcherry? When I met Stevie... I was 19. Like I said, I moved to Hollywood and I met him at a job. I I started working at this used clothing store, Aardvarks, and um, and we worked together. And he was like, Stevie's got great style. Stevie can make put anything on and look good. I fucking hate it. He does have a great style, man. He really does. He he does it. He can put anything. When I met him, he had like long dreads, you know, he had his long hair and he had dreads and he would wear like he would wear like overalls and no shirt. And or with like a tank top underneath and and like Doc Martens and he looked amazing, you know. And and he was all he was really into Prince, you know. And and he had a, he had a he was doing his own singer songwriter thing and it was kind of princey. And I love Prince and so we totally bonded on Prince. And then we liked partying together. And then we got we became roommates and we were we were the toxic twins, you know. We were like crazy, you know. I have stories, crazy stories with Stevie. I mean, we've been held, we, we ditched cabs and got held up by cabbies with guns and holy like, fuck. Crazy, Jesus. crazy Jesus shit. Christ. Like, you know, yeah, we, you know, we, used to, I used to bounce checks to, to Ralph's just to get beer, you know, and, and like at one point we bought a sheet of acid with our last paycheck and quit our jobs and we were going to be like acid dealers of, you know, Los Angeles and, and nobody, and then only to come to find out that nobody wanted to buy acid in LA. Like it wasn't like orange County, you know? And so we had all this acid and no money. And we, we just wound up eating the whole fucking sheet of acid over time. Cause we would just, Jesus. you know, so like, those are just a few, uh, you know, of the stories of Stevie and I, but anyways, before, uh, we actually became, you know, in a band, you know, he, he did his, he had, he had a lot of other things he was doing. And I was in a band called slam hound at the time. And, um, so it wasn't until, uh, t- you know, 2005 when Buck Cherry, when we were looking for, um, a guitar player, you know, he was always close to me and, um, you know, Keith really liked him and it was just a good fit. And that's when it happened. In a way, is uh, is Stevie like your uh, quote unquote like musical soulmate? Because it seems like you know once he joined Buck Cherry, you know for the fifteen album. I mean that obviously blew the band up, and and uh, then obviously War Paint was you know the record he was heavily involved in, and that was such a good album. And uh, then the whole you know Josh Todd and the conflict thing. Yeah, you know. Uh... It's weird how Stevie and I have always been brought 
back together because we were roommates in an apartment that come like this speaker house where all these people were doing meth and it became like really dark and we had a couple roommates and I had to get the fuck out of there. That's when I got sober and I lost touch with Stevie for a while because I had to kind of cut off everybody and everything so that I could get clean, you know? And, and then, you know, I like to say a God of our understanding brought us together like later on because he got, he got clean on his own path, his own journey. And then, you know, I went through the demise of my band and then, you know, Buck Cherry started happening and Buck Cherry had already been happening for a few years. And then all of a sudden, Stevie, I ran into him at some restaurant and I was like, dude, I'm so glad you're here. And, and like we connected and then he was sober and I, I was sober and I'm like, it was amazing. And then we just we picked up right where we left off, except this time we were clean, you know, and and then one thing led to another. And that's that's how it all worked out. I know uh, Mike Platnikoff did uh, 15 and uh, War Paint. Is he doing uh, the, the new record too? No, Marty Ferguson uh, produced this record and uh, he co-wrote a lot of the songs with us, you know, just like he co-wrote Sorry with us and a, and a bunch of other songs. Um, it, it's just been so great to be back with him and we had a lot of fun making this record. Uh, well, uh, uh, a few other things before we uh, wrap it up. One, uh, back to the conflict real quick. I know you said that uh, I believe that there's already a concept album that's in the works or maybe it's already done and in the can. I'm not sure. Uh, I have a concept in mind and we could do it really quickly, but I don't want to, uh, you know, don't know when that could ever possibly happen. But right now, one day at a time, we don't know what's going to happen, you know, um, but I'm open to everything of course you know but we have to just play it out and see what's going on but right now it's all about hellbound june 25th buck cherry we're hitting the road june 1st and got to get this record you can pre-order it now or uh get it june 25th but i know you're you're a huge uh animal guy and uh, i think specifically i think you uh said you're a big fan of uh you like big cats a lot and I love big cats yeah what uh what did you think i'm sure you've been asked this before but what did you think of uh tiger king Oof, that was a, I mean, you know, it was interesting to watch and funny, you know, but as far as animals being, you know, uh, being cooped up like that, and I, I don't know how they, they were treated there. I just, I don't know enough about the story. I don't know enough about those places, you know, but the show was entertaining. I got a kick out of that, you know, just like everybody else did. But um, I just like more like, you know, big cats in the wild and, and sure watching you know that that type of thing my wife is really into them too that's we've bonded on on oh you know not just we we really like elephants and like at some point i want to go to africa it's really uh something on my bucket list well and then the uh the, the final thing before we we wrap it up here uh, we are huge fans of buck cherry on this show and uh caitlin over here she is uh at one point when she first started on the show we realized that she is a fantastic singer and so we decided right. that, that the two uh there's another guy that's on the show he couldn't be here today but his name is cody the alcoholic but uh we had trent and and uh <laughs> and cody the alcoholic uh do some buck cherry karaoke at one point on the show yeah it was a lot of fun to see this i was hoping that uh yeah i was hoping i could play you this uh audio real quick and get your genuine opinions on it give it to me I uh, let's see. I uh, I'm gonna try Are to. Are you singing on it? I am not What's singing your name again. I'm. I'm no, Logan. The, the female. The female. Oh, What's Caitlin. Your name? No, she is not Caitlin. singing on it. No, I'm not singing. <laughs> nice to meet you. I was, nice to meet you too. Yeah. So this first one, this is from Cody the alcoholic, who uh, could not be here today, but uh, this is his attempt at uh, uh, lit up. So let me yeah. know. Let me know if you can hear it. All right. Yo, mama said packing lines is a sin. And yes, I'm all <laughs> lit up again on the couch in my bed. And yes, I'm all lit up again. Flying. I love the cocaine. I love the cocaine. Uh, mama, can you wait? Mama, can you wait? So that is uh, Cody the alcoholic doing lit up. <laughs> what did you uh, What did you think about that? It's not good. 
Oh boy, he's gonna be so crushed. I've been saying it for weeks. Like I almost feel bad playing that for you because we all agreed it was so bad. We need to see your reaction. <laughs> and oh, let's see. I think we lost him again for oh. a second. Yeah, uh, you know, you got to be really good now. You got to be really good because we got people like crushing so hot on the guitar now and little video clips online. And so you got to be really good. Well, here's uh, Trent, which is uh, he he is here. This is uh, he did crazy bitch, and I got to tell you. I don't think it's that bad. I think I don't think it's good, but it's it's certainly better than uh, Code of the Alcoholic. But let's see what you think. Here we go. Scream so loud, get fucking laid. You want me to stay, but I got to make my way. Hey, you're crazy, bitch, but you fuck so good. I'm on top of it when I dream. I'm doing you all night. The scratch is all down my back to get me right on. Right? That wasn't that bad, right? Well, he's got to sing a whole octave higher, you know, in the verses. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, the thing with Crazy Bitch, what everybody misses with that song is soul. You got you to gotta, you gotta have that soul. You know, it's like uh, when I came up with the chorus of it, I wanted it to be like a hip hop track or like, you know, um, just a very soulful sounding song with not a lot of bells and whistles, a lot of space and just the groove. You know, so if you think about that, when you approach it next time and think about the pocket, got to stay in that pocket in order to make it work, you know, yeah, so okay. maybe get a click track going. Yeah, there you so go, you Trent. Can, uh, it, it's all about timing, you know, yeah. that's it. If you work, work on your timing and then start singing that verse an octave higher. See, we did this. Good. We did this on the spot when you wanted me to do it. Yeah, I did put them on the spot when we did it, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I would love to practice. And that's maybe all right. Do you got to just, just dance with it, <laughs> dance with it and you'll hit it. Well, you know? Josh, uh, yeah. thank you so much for being here. We really do appreciate it. Yes, thank you. My pleasure. You guys are great. Great, great questions. Uh, make sure you check out Hellbound when it comes out June 25th. And I don't know, Josh, maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll see you in, uh, I think you're coming to Cleveland, yeah, I, I believe. Blues. Yeah, yeah. Great. So Let's do it. Maybe we'll make see sure you there. Make sure you guys come up and say hello. Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah, man. Uh, good all right. luck. Good luck with your singing, Kaylin. Oh, thank you. Know? you. Yeah, she's the really best, good. You know? I, she is actually really good. The other two, just... you know what I mean? Just, uh, just be relentless every day. Try to learn something new. Try to better your range. You know, try to try to yeah. do something better. You know that that's that's it. Yeah. Every, thank you. Everything works out. Well, Josh, thank you. We will be right back on the crash re- uh, crash report. Hang on. <laughs> We'll see you next time on The Crash Report. While you wait, make sure to like and subscribe to the show, damn it. Thanks for listening.